Let's get cracking, people. I would like you to, I want to do an exercise. I want to do this together. Um, I don't usually do it like this, but you wouldn't have known that, so I shouldn't have told you. But I did. And I would like to do the following. I want you all to think of a time in your life. Think of a time in your life when you were happy. Think of a time in your life when you were happy. Ah. And I'm like, don't tell me what it is. Just think about it. Think about a time in your life when you're happy. Anyone else have a time in your life when you're happy? Think of a time in your life when you're happy. I want to guide you a little bit, and I want you not to confuse something, which maybe is not confusion. We'll, we'll take a look soon when we get into some, some sort of definitions. But pleasure and happiness don't necessarily come together. Does that make sense, what I just said? You could have pleasure without being happy. You get that? That's just a guiding, and we're going to go on. Now, we've come up with a couple of examples. Now I want to get a bit deeper. And I'd like a definition. We say things all the time. We throw things out all the time, right? When we're having conversations with people, we'll say sentences that we don't really mean when we say them. For example, someone goes and gives you something. You go, oh, my gosh, thank you so much. I love you. They're like, I didn't know you felt that way about me, right? And he says, no, it doesn't mean I love you. It means thank you, right? So when we say love, what does love mean, right? When we say happiness, what does happiness mean? Can anyone give me a definition of happiness? And remember, you cannot use the word in the definition. You see, it's, it's just, I find it interesting that not everybody here is nailing it. In other words, like, bam, I go ask, give me the definition of happiness. It should be, now, truth is you could turn this on me in anything that I'm going to say, right? No matter what word I say, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? Right? You could do that to me also. But it's interesting that a word which we use so often, I just want to be happy, right? I just want happiness in my life. I was so happy when. You make me happy. Happiness is just an illusion filled with sadness and confusion, yeah? But we have all these ideas, but we don't know what it is. We're not able to nail it down. Is that, do, you, do you agree with me? Do you find that interesting? A word which we use all the time, but we have no idea how to define it. When I say no idea, I don't mean no idea. We have, uh, some of us have no idea. Others have an idea of some sorts. Understand, does anyone here want to be happy? Let's do it the opposite. Anyone not want to be happy? Great, everyone wants to be happy. How do you plan on doing it if you don't know the definition? So every one of us wants to be happy. It's, it's a reality that everything we're doing in our life, we're really ultimately trying to be. We want that, right? That's like the goal. One of the classic discussions that they have here in Eishat Torah, by the way, welcome, this is Eishat Torah. One of the classic discussions they have here is like, do you want to be happy or do you want to be rich? Right? And everyone, uh, both. Right? Okay, yeah, do you want to be happy or do you want to be rich? And we all know that money buys happiness, <laughs> right? Everyone's clear on that? Our idea is what? Money buys happiness? Not exactly. Who really says no, though? Those who don't have it. No, but the truth is, the reality is money doesn't buy happiness. I think we can know that. But I love when people say, but I know someone who's rich and he's happy. What are you going to say now, fool? And I say back, okay, he might be happy, but it's not because of the money. He's happy for other reasons. You ask the person who's rich, why are you happy? As a matter of fact, most people that become rich are quite unhappy. But the truth is that's not fair because that's done only by lottery winners. You understand? People who get sudden you know, increases of money, then they go, and we know the classic stories. There was a guy who won the Powerball. It used to be a lot of money, $350 million. Right, now it's up to like the parable is like 600 million or something like that, right? So you guys know what the parable is? Okay. So, no, it was about a month ago. 600, 652 people won. Yeah, whatever. So the idea is, it wasn't me. I, I couldn't understand why though. I, like, I thought I was going to have it, but I just, I didn't buy a ticket. But anyway, the idea is that uh, when I won, I mean, when I didn't win, um, I was on the phone with my father. I was like, I can't believe it. He's like, what? I'm like, those, are the, those numbers were exactly the numbers that I always play. Those numbers that won. He's like, you serious? I'm like, I've never played in my life, right? But if I were to play, that's what I would play. So the idea is what? The idea I'm trying to say is that people win the lottery, and they, they go ahead, this one guy, I, can't, I wish I had his name. I'm sure you, you've maybe seen this documentary about this guy. He, he won $350 million, and let's fast forward to the end. The end of the story, I mean, or the part of the story that it was not, I mean, he's still alive, I think, but one of his granddaughters committed suicide. Uh, he ended up totally in debt. He had no friends, ended up getting divorced, losing everything. So he says, he said that he wishes when he won that he would have ripped the ticket up and thrown it in the garbage. When a person goes out and gets so much money, we don't even know what to do with it. We don't know what to do. Everyone always says, if I win, I would do this. You know, I would put it in an in a, you know, offshore account that no one knows, even though the American government knows everything now. Uh, and then I would go ahead and I would uh, put it in investments and I would go do very smart things because everyone else didn't say that, right? Everybody says that, but we get caught up, right? And what happens eventually, they go and they end up losing everything. Clearly, that's not the thing which is going to buy, buy a person happiness. Now, when you said not sadness, 
That's where I want to now show you the following idea. When a person goes ahead and they win the lottery, what happens at that moment? Their sadness is no longer there, so to speak, right? They have this, you know, this, this unbelievable, we'll call it happiness. But the reality is they're not happy, they're just not sad. You, you understand what I'm saying? There's something called status quo, just I am. There's someone who's happy, there's someone who's sad, and there's someone who's lack of sad, which is just not sad, but that doesn't mean you're happy. Just because you take away something sad doesn't mean necessarily that you're happy. But let's, let's take it a little, bit, a little bit further now. What's the definition? How does a person get happiness? We all want it. Everybody wants in your life. Think about a time in your life when you were truly happy and try to see the common denominator of why were you happy at that moment. And when then you could understand why that was, take that as a definition and now you can apply it anywhere in your life. You get that? When a person goes ahead and figures out what the root of something is, they can now apply it anywhere. And furthermore, how can a person live a life of happiness with so much pain and suffering going on in the world? How could, how could you even be so selfish to even think of being ever happy? Do you understand what I mean when I say that? You look around the world, and you're like, no, everything's good, I'm cool, I'm fine, turn on TV. So 40 people died in Sudan today. You're like, okay, shut up, let's go eat lunch. All right? How could, how could you do that? How could you live in a world which is so not happy, right? <laughs> So I want to share with you just an insight, which I think is un unbelievable. There was a woman who was a Holocaust survivor, and she was, uh, one day she's walking, someone comes over and says, you know, you, don't, you really you don't look happy. So she goes, why would you say that? He goes, because you're not smiling. She goes, what does smiling have to do with happiness? And at first thought, that's like, that's a little weird. What are you talking about, right? Because we know it's an emotional response of the body. When you go with serotonin, go and leaves the brain, comes out, what happened? That you smile, right? What are you, what are you asking? What does it have to do with it? That has very much to do with it. The answer is not necessarily, though. A person can be unbelievably happy and not smiling at all. You can have people that are smiling away. You know, the people like walk in there, everything's, how are you always so happy? The answer is, <laughs> I'm putting on a show because I have no life. <laughs> and they're really unbelievably depressed inside. Anyone know someone like that? People that smile, they put on this front as if everything's okay. And they'll go like, yeah, oh, everything's all right. <laughs> no woman, no cry. <laughs> everything's good. Everything's going to, right? And the answer is, no, not everything is all right. Everything is really not all right. And people who put on that show, one day they crumble. One day, one day they crumble. And all my life they've been waiting for it. They've been praying for it. But what happens is they crumble. I mean, it's, it's a sad thing. So if we don't get down to clarity of what happiness is, and people, now we're young, we're young, we're young, which means we have the opportunity now to nail that sucker. Not get caught up in life in something which we're not happy with. Not get involved in a job or in a relationship or in a job or a relationship. I don't hear it started a job yet. Anyone started? One, two, three, four, five. Once I caught a fish alive. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then I let him go again. Why did you let him go? And the idea is what? You started a job. Anyone here in a relationship? Don't answer. You started a job, you're in a relationship. Is it good? Is it good? Is it, is it good? Are you, are you happy? Are you happy with that job and that relationship? Well, it could be that right now you're enjoying it. That doesn't mean you're happy with it. You better get this clear. You better get this clear quick. Just because somebody is smiling doesn't mean it's good. You want to take a look, by the way, I'll just give you the idea of an outside, how sometimes an outside is total fake. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to ruffle some of your feathers here. That's my goal. My goal is to upset you. If anyone here is in a relationship or you know someone in a relationship, those people who walk around doing what we call PDA, you familiar with PDA? Public displays of affection holding hands, hugging. I'm only saying this now, I'm, I'm saying this cautiously because I see no one is doing it now. Sometimes I have in the group, like people are like all over each other, right? What's up, man? Right, it's a, like, they're all, it's a pleasure. Right, they're all over each other. And that's why I wouldn't do it right now, yeah. <laughs> you guys know each other? <laughs> We've known each other for so long. And it's like, like this, yeah? That those who are giving public displays of affection Check it yourself. Look at statistics yourself in your own life. I don't mean like numbers on the board. I mean your own people that you have noticed. Generally speaking, those people go down, they go down hard. Those relationships end very quickly. Though you can tell, you can tell a strength of a relationship by how affectionate they are in public. The more one is affectionate in public, the less their relationship is. Because they have to show everyone else. And they need everyone else to see that, look, we have a relationship. Those who have a strong, fortified relationship, I don't need to show. I'm not saying you can't hold hands in public. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, but like all over each other, right? You don't need to do that. You don't need to show the world. If you feel like you need to show the world, that means that there's something you're lacking. You get it? So sometimes it's the outside that you think that everything's okay. They're smiling, therefore they're happy, right? Not necessarily. As a matter of fact, it might be quite en contraire, as they say français, which means just the opposite. Okay, so let's take it a step further. Then. What is happiness? So I'm going to give you a definition, which I think is an incredible idea. It goes through... 
I, it, it's so intuitive. You're going to see when, what I'm going to say. It's going to be clear. And uh, Steve, it's very similar to what you said, possibly. It might be even the same thing. It goes like this. Happiness is the feeling that one gets when they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Happiness is a feeling that one gets when they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. If you are right, if you're one and unified, like you mentioned, yeah, and I don't know what you meant by that, but if you meant this, right, good. And even if you didn't, then great. Yeah, you know, it always works out. You know, the teacher's like, did you mean this? You're like, yes. They're like, well, you're wrong. And I know, but no, but that's good. That's good. Exactly, right? It is what happiness is a feeling when you do it. Now, now let's go back. Um, don't tell me, Mitch, right? So, Mitch, you said Disneyland. And then when I asked you, does it fit his definition? Then you said, well, I don't know, I was six. The answer is, it perfectly fit the definition. You know why? Because at six years old, that's what every six-year-old thinks that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go to Disneyland, right? M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U. Right? That's what you're supposed to do, right? My, uh, my wife, when she was young, they went, my, my wife's family went to Disneyland. And my brother-in-law at the time was about three years old. And they rented out this little place at Disneyland, this little, I don't know, I don't think it was a hotel, like a little condo, whatever they have around the area. And my mother-in-law notices there's a mouse. There was a mouse in the room. So my mom in law goes to my father-in-law and says, um, I saw a, uh, he's like, what? And all the kids are there, he's like, an M-O-U-S-E. And my three-year-old brother-in-law goes, a mouse? <laughs> right? He's like, how did you know how to spell? You're in Disneyland, right? M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E. That's how you hear all day. You know so of course he knows. Like you didn't know how to spell. He's like, a mouse, right? And says, what do we have, though? At six years old, that's it. That's what life is about. It's about going to Disneyland. You get it? When you go and you finish your project, when you finish that project, you're supposed to be finishing that project. Happiness, I'm going to give you another one. You, when you climb that mountain, when you climb the Alps, Michael, when you go and you climb the Alps, you know what you did over there? You are accomplished. You accomplished something. But it's more than just accomplishment. Accomplishment's not enough. It's meaningful accomplishment. Because if it's accomplishment, I can make a puzzle. I can make a four-piece puzzle. I feel so happy. <laughs> it's, just, it's a four-piece puzzle. It's a big deal, right? Because it's not meaningful. But what happens if I build like one of those 3D puzzles with like 12,000 pieces? You guys know what I'm talking about? Right? My mother was very into those. Made all those puzzles, right? These unbelievable puzzles. After you finish, don't you feel amazing? Because you accomplished, and you have given meaning to that project. Since you gave meaning to that project, therefore you feel incredibly happy. When you finished high school, you were happy to get out of there. Right, but you also felt happy because it was, again, a meaningful accomplishment. You were doing what you were supposed to be doing. It doesn't mean smiling, people. I'll give you an example that I saw from Rabbi Tatz. An amazing example. All right, now let's say you're living out. You've never seen a gym before in your life. A gym where people work out, yeah? So you go ahead. And you go to, you know, the big city of, of Cleveland, and you go in there, or Cincinnati, whatever. Where are you from? Youngstown. You go to Youngstown, right, to visit people there, and you see this sign that says GIM. You're like, cool, let me check it out. So you walk, you know, you see this GIM, otherwise known as a gym, by the way. All right, James? And you see, like, the windows are, like, frosty, you know what I mean, that you can't see inside. You want to see what it is, so you like look through the keyhole. It's like, I don't know why people still have the old-fashioned, it's just open, but you know, you look through, yeah? And you can't see because it's really tight, but you go and you look through. And you see there's a guy lying in a bench. He's lying in a bench, and there's a pole on his neck, this metal pole on his neck. And you're like, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, this, this guy's being tortured. You're like, forget this. If it, but it was kung fu fighting, <laughs> you kick that thing open. But it doesn't work because it's really, it's locked. Yeah? But then, you know, you turn it up, you open it. But -da 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 -da. you walk in and there's the guy, he's lying on the bench. Like, you're like, oh my gosh, someone left him here with a metal thing on his neck with these two massive metal pieces on the side. This guy's going to die. So you walk over and you're like, dude, I'm here. And you start lifting it up and the guy starts pulling it down. He's like, what are you doing? You're like, don't worry. You're like, what are you doing? You'll thank me later, right? The guy goes and you, you, finally you, you struggle out and you put it up on that thing. Yeah, you know what's going on here, James, right? Okay, good. And then the guy's like, what are you doing? You're like, I saved your life. He's like, what do you mean saved my life? He's like, what do you mean, man? I saved your life. He's like, I paid for this. You go, you pay for this? Dude, what are you into, right? That's messed up, yeah? So he goes, yeah, what do you mean? I paid for this. He goes, why would you pay for this? He goes, I don't know what he's talking about. Now, what was happening? The guy was working out, right? But you look at the guy's face. He's sweating. 
He's got this look of like uh, on his face, like this intent, like pain on his face, right? He must not be happy. But anyone here has ever worked out before, not for health. I mean, you've worked out for idolatry because you want to look good. If anyone's ever worked out because you want to look good, was that too heavy? If anyone's ever worked out because they want to look good, the pain is the placer. Is that right? The pain is the pleasure. When you're climbing that mountain, every step you take, ding, 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 every move you, every time you're walking up that mountain, you're like, ah, ah. It's even flat, you know? You're like, ah, right? But then you get to the part which is that, you can't do it because you need the energy. Like, mm, then flat, ah, right? What happens? You feel great. You feel amazing, right? You feel amazing when you go and you do something with accomplishing, but it's a meaningful accomplishment. And when you give meaning to something, what happens? You feel unbelievably connected to that thing, and you feel happy, even if you're not smiling. Does that make sense? What's happiness? The feeling that one gets when they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. However, there's a level below that. There's a level. There's two different types of happiness. Okay? How do you spell it? H-A-P-P-I-N-E-S. Two S's or one? <laughs> two. Two? All right. Happiness. You better be right. All right, so the idea is happiness. Happiness is the feeling that one gets when they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. This is where things get a little bit crazy, people. So if happiness is the feeling one gets when they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, can a person fool themselves into thinking they're doing what they're supposed to be doing? Right? Don't we do that all the time? Aren't there things that we do all the time that we think we're supposed to be doing? What would be the op opposite of happiness? Let's think it through. Think it through. What would be the opposite of happiness? The word I don't think is sadness. I think it's m much deeper. Depression. Think about it. Have you ever invested in something and then you've come to the realization that it was a waste of time? Right? Like a relationship. <laughs> right? You, 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 you give it to something, you, you give to something, you give to something, and then you wake up and realize, this is totally wrong. How do you feel at that moment? For the past like year of my life, two years, three years, I've been doing not only not happiness, but the opposite of it. That's when we fall into like a depression. And that's when we start to like stop and then things just build on themselves, more depression, more depression. Does everybody hear what's going on here? That's when it's, I'll give you an example. So you go ahead, Josh, and you know, you, you donate money. You hear about a camp, you get a little brochure, the WKJ Camp of America, <laughs> special. <laughs> and, and you're like, wow, so nice. You know, I think I'll donate some money, you know, to the WKJ Camp of America. So you donate one year, the next year. So finally you get like one of their pamphlets where they spell it WKJ stands for We Kill Jews. How do you feel after a couple of years of donating to this wonderful camp? Probably pretty terrible. Right? Pretty terrible, <laughs> right? When you've just gone and invested so much into not only baloney, but might even be against you. You hear what's going on here, people? Happiness is the feeling that one gets when they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. But there's a level below that, which is actually the same level. It's just not ultimate. That's the feeling that one gets when they're doing what they think they should be doing. When you do what you think you should be doing, as long as you never find out reality, you'll be okay. You get that? For example, a kid goes in, he sells lemonade. He sells lemonade on a corner for 10 cents a cup. After a full day, he walked away with a dollar. How does that kid feel? He feels amazing, right? He feels incredible. What happens when he learns the value of a dollar? He'll never be selling lemonade on a corner again, right? Unless it's Manhattan for $40 a cup, yeah? See, what happened over there is that he realized, wait a minute, everything I just put into is really not true. So people, watch this. If it's true, what we're saying, and I think we could agree with this, is, does anyone disagree with our definition so far? I think it very much fits everyone's life. Anything you've ever been happy with are usually things that you felt meaningful accomplishment that you're supposed to be doing this thing. When your sister is born, well, you say that's not what I'm doing, but it's something which is in line with what's supposed to be done. You see, there's a line in Hebrew which says, Ein simcha ka'atoros asfekos. There is no happiness like releasing doubt. Has anyone here ever had a state of doubt in your life? You don't know which way to go. You're just not sure. Do I go to this university or that one? Do I, do I take this job or that? Do I hang out with this person or that one? Do I do this, do I do that? Have you ever had it where it's like coming down to the wire that you have to make a decision and you just don't know what to do and you feel like so confused and you're just like, ah, it's really, it starts, you feel it. Like it's, you feel Pressure. You know what I'm talking about? You feel that pressure? Then somebody comes over and you're like, dude, I got this problem. I can't even, I don't know what to do. And the person speaks to you. Within a minute, he gives you clarity. 
he or she gives you clarity of which direction you should go on. Has anyone ever had that happen to them? You have a doubt what to do in your life, then somebody says something to you which gives you clarity. How do you feel at that moment? How do you feel? Happy. Incredibly happy. You feel, wow, why? All those doubts are away. I now know what I'm supposed to be doing. When you figure out what you're supposed to be doing, life is incredible. You get it? Okay, so now here comes the question. Have you guys figured out what you're supposed to be doing? Have you stopped and thought it through enough? Have you worked it out? Or are you just doing what you think you should be doing? Have you challenged it? Have you worked it through? You understand what I'm asking now, yeah? And I'm not actually challenging anyone out right here. I'm bringing it out as a thought. Take it or leave it, yeah? Some of you can walk out saying, yeah, I did that, I'm good. Others might say, you know, I'm not really sure. You see, if I were to tell you, and everybody wants happiness, if I were to tell you there's a greater level of happiness than what you have right now, you would never be happy in your life doing what you're doing until you figure out what that thing is and then disprove it or go with it. You get it? If I tell you there's something greater than what you're doing with your life right now, I'm going to tell you right now, okay, I don't, I, don't, I don't know you, right? But you I know. I don't really know you. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, there is something greater than what you're doing right now. Uh, I'm, I'm, this is just an exercise. I'm not really saying this. For some of you, I really am. There is something greater than what you have right now. There's something much greater than what you have right now. You could be having real happiness that will last forever. Now you may say, what do you mean? What's, uh, what's the problem? As long as I live in my ignorant is bliss, right? Ignorance is bliss. As long as I don't know about it, then I'll be happy. The answer is, yeah, okay, you might be for a while. But if you ever wake up from that daze, you're going to be unbelievably depressed. You get it? person who lives in that state of ignorance is bliss, it's like a kid who goes to high school. And he goes and, he, you know, he fools everyone because he, like, cuts school a lot. He cuts school a lot. But the teachers don't know. <laughs> Suckers. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> I made it. I made it, and then it's time to get a job, and he can't get a job because he didn't learn anything his whole life. Who did he mess over now? You get it? Who'd you fool now? You fooled yourself, sucker. You messed yourself up. You hear what I just said? A person who goes, you think you're fooling the world. Yeah, it's like, you know, the religious kid who, like, sneaks in a ham sandwich. <laughs> the rabbi didn't see. <laughs> the rabbi didn't see. <laughs> There was once this guy who, you know, he couldn't help himself. He had a craving to eat not kosher. A Jewish guy, religious, observant, orthodox, whatever word you don't have a psychological problem with. And what happens, he goes ahead. He goes into this, you know, restaurant. He's eating non kosher. And the rabbi's walking by, and he looks, and he sees there's one of his congregants eating non kosher. He's like, so they, they meet eyes. And the guy, he's like, so the guy comes out. He's like, rabbi. He's like, what were you doing? He's like, did you see me? He's like, yeah, I saw you. He said, did you see me eating that non-kosher meat? He said, yeah, I saw. Did you see me drinking that non-kosher wine? He goes, yeah, I saw. He said, thank God I was under rabbinical supervision. <laughs> and he says, what? Well, we say nonetheless is what? We tricked them, right? But what happens, what happens if, the big if, if Judaism and Torah is true? What happens if it's true, Michael? And then after a person dies, they get upstairs, they're like, I fooled them. <laughs> You're on a highway to hell. You understand what's going on? It's okay, there's a stairway to heaven. I'll show you where it is. You understand what's going on, people? Oh, we fooled everyone. Assuming you never wake up in this world, we have another world, if there is one. But what happens if you do wake up in this world and we realize, oh my gosh, this is a waste of time? What happens if you start to realize that the project you worked on was just silly? It was just for nothing. Then all of a sudden, we sink into depression. Happiness is a feeling that one gets when they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Level below that is, happiness is a feeling that one gets when they're doing what they think they should be doing. But you better get sure that what you think actually is true. Because if you start investing in something which isn't true, you start putting into it, either make sure you don't wake up, or start changing it. Does everybody get what's happening here? It's a very scary concept if you really think about it. It's, it's early to talk about this, sorry. But the idea is what to get our life on track, to start thinking about it. I'm not, I'm not suggesting anything right now yet. I haven't yet suggested anything. But I'm just pointing out right now, whatever it is, break it down, get it clear. Because when you do what you know is right, there is nothing better in life. When you're on track with what the way it's supposed to be and you understand it, even if it's difficult, challenging, and hard, you love it. You get that? Now the question is, how is one supposed to figure out what they're supposed to do? So how do you figure that out? Thanks, 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 Friedman. Like cliffhanger, I'm going to be depressed the rest of my life. We're all out of time. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I think, no, I think that question was a little bit too theoretical. 
In other words, what I mean by that is, I'll explain. I have no problem with the theoretical question. But there's, there's theoretical and then there's the what-if zone. The what-if zone is like when my father used to say, what if your head was in your tuchus? Would you put on tefillin? Right? And it's a good question, right? By the way, if you would, don't make a bracha, yeah? But the idea is, what, so what if? You know, there's certain ridiculous what ifs. Skiv, with all due respect, I think that we've just shifted a little bit. Let's jump out a little and go to theoretical, okay? The theoretical question is, what if, in theory, what theoretical, you have something you're supposed to be doing, right? Let's say it's saving puppies from, from ants. It's saving puppies from ants. Okay, so you go ahead, and what you're supposed to be doing, now ultimately, in order to carry out a certain task, there are certain prerequisites to carry out that task, right? One of them is you need to be able to be alive, yeah? The other is you have to be able to breathe. What if it has to be in outer space, where there's no oxygen, right? Okay, so you gotta figure out a way to have oxygen. One of them is that you need to be able to eat, you need to be able to sleep, right? So all these are part and parcel of this bigger picture. That whatever the, if, whatever the theoretical thing you're supposed to be doing is, you need to have prerequisites, and that's, you need to sometimes have money to do that, right? So let's give an example. I'll, I'll give you an example, which I think is a, I think is a very apropos one. Let's go right-wing, Haredi, you know, religious on you for a minute, okay? Let's say what you're supposed to be doing is sitting and studying Torah. Let's say, for, in theory, one's supposed to be doing that. Now, if you take a look in the Talmud, you'll notice that some of the greatest sages that we have ever had had jobs. They worked. Right, and they were shoemakers, and they were there were blacksmiths, and like one of the gr the greatest. Think of like great. I don't know if you know, where you're holding in great rabbi knowledge, but let's say you knew a great rabbi of today who's just sitting and studying. It's a very new phenomena. It's a new phenomena that we have so many Jewish people, religious people, sitting and studying Torah as a profession, so to speak. Right? It's a new phenomena. Back in the day, people had to work and whatever it is. Now, if some people will sponsor and support and whatever, but again, new phenomena. So you go back, and you go, and they're working, they're working, they're working. There's an idea of ikr and tafel, which means the main thing and the secondary thing. Even though they may have been working for a long time, and they were working, 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 the working was solely in order to support themselves, in order to go sit down and study. The Chafetz Chaim, have you heard of him before, the Chafetz Chaim? You know who that was? Rabbi Sroll Meir Kohen Kagan, lived from 1839 to 1933, not even 100 years ago. One of the greatest rabbis of the, of the 20th century, and really of many centuries. Uh, he had a bookstore. And as soon as he made enough money in the day, he would close the bookstore, and then he would go study. So you know, that's why we say what the theoretical is that you'll never be able to get to it. I just have a hard time believing that that's the case, right? That you'll never be able to get to it. Timing-wise, maybe it'll be less time than you would want to have done. Okay, but you got to do what you got to do to survive. You got to do what you got to do in order to live, right? However, don't let that become your focus. You hear? When a person goes ahead and they're working, the question is, is the work a means to an end or an end in and of itself? Now, sometimes they come together. So if a person is an accountant, and the reason they're an accountant is in order to support their family, to have a nice, beautiful life with their family. So don't get so caught up with the accounting that you're talking about it when you're not working. You get it? If your profession is that you're a doctor, so then okay, then it's about helping people, and it's just regardless of hours. Did that answer your question in any way, shape, or form? Okay. So now the idea is what? How does a person figure out? Mike, did you want to say something before? How does a person figure out what is their goal? So from a Jewish perspective, I'll tell you the following, and take it, out, take it or leave it. A Jewish perspective, we have two goals. Number one is what's called the national goal. The national goal is the Torah. The Torah is our goal in terms of the fact that we've got to do this. Now, assuming it's true. In other words, if the Torah is true and it really was given by God, and God gave it to the Jewish people to do, that means we're supposed to be doing it. And happiness is the feeling that one gets when they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. So if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, and you fully understand and appreciate and recognize that this is what you're supposed to be doing, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But if you don't recognize that you're supposed to be doing it, then you feel pain, even if it is what you're supposed to be doing. Do you get that? If you're really supposed to be working out, but you don't understand that, therefore you, 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 you hate it, that's only because you didn't get it. But when you appreciate and you recognize and internalize the fact that what you're supposed to be doing, you feel unbelievable. That's a national mission. How do you figure out your individual mission? Every person is brought down in this world, they have a purpose. There is no, per there's no person here that is here that there's no reason for. How does a person figure this out? There's a way of doing it even before just trial and error. Before you get to the trial and error stage, what do you do? If I were to drop you off at a work site, if I, at a work site where they're working, construction, construction site, yeah? And I would say, it's 9 o'clock in the morning, I drop you off, there's nobody there, there's a building that's half built. And I'll say, listen, I'll be back. Okay, I'll be back. Uh, go to work, goodbye. What would you work on? What would you do? You got plumbing, electricity, you got mason work, you got uh, tiling, you got, you got lighting, what would you do? Now that's a very interesting answer you just gave. Don't we do that sometimes? Don't we do in life? Let's just see what the easiest thing is. 
And don't we sometimes go and do what the easiest thing is, and then we're not so happy afterwards? You're like, I don't understand why I'm not happy. It's because it's not what you're supposed <laughs> to be doing. Don't just go for the easiest job, Danny boy. I'll give you another answer. Now, let's say I dropped you off, but I didn't just drop you off by yourself. I dropped you off by yourself, but with a toolbox. What's the first thing you do? Open the toolbox. You open the toolbox, and all of a sudden, you start seeing electrical equipment. What should you work on? The plumbing. All right, the answer is what? Electricity, obviously, right? Every single one of us, we have specific talents and abilities that, that are inside of our toolbox. We are put here in this world, and we have specific things, A, that we're drawn towards, that we just like naturally, that we like to do. There are other things that we have that we're naturally talented and that we have, and we have to start to look into our toolbox and see, wow, I have this. Maybe I'm supposed to be doing something with this. I don't know how to swim. Don't become a lifeguard. You understand? person goes in and understands to so open up and start thinking, breaking it down. What are you supposed to be doing? Number one is a national mission. That's something called the Torah. If a person goes and says, well, I'm really good at, um, I'm really good marksman. I can sneak up on people. I'll be a hitman, right? It can't be against what the Torah is saying. National mission and then individual. National Torah. Individual within that concept of confinement, of trying to understand of where is my role, what am I supposed to be doing? And when you start attaching to that, then you get into the trial and error. You start doing it. When you start doing it, you're going to start being connected with it. You know why? Because every one of us is given a soul. Everyone is given a neshama. And that neshama, that soul, what? Is connected to a certain mission. There is no one in the world that can do what you can do. No one. This is not to make you feel good. There is no one. If I want to make you feel good, let's say maybe something else. But there's no one in the world that could do what you can do. No one. What about no, what about no, what about no one? What about no one? You see, because if they could do it, you wouldn't be here. The fact that you're here means that there's something that only you, you and only you can accomplish. And you've got to figure out what that is. And when you start working on that, and you start figuring it out, and you start implementing it, there's nothing greater. Therefore, let's do a quick recap of everything we did. End off with one point. I'm going to take any questions, comments, stories, jokes, attacks. Here we go. So start beginning by telling you, tell me three, tell me something that goes ahead and made you happy. Think about a time in your life when you were happy. Tell me about going to Disneyland. They were climbing the mountain. Nobody was finishing high school. It was finishing a project. Whatever that the person goes through, there'll be all these different things in our life to make us happy. Now, what's the definition of happiness, right? Um, we got all these ideas. Well, it's you know being one with El Mundo and the planet, as you say, right? There's what going on with the idea. Being a one is kind of a unifying factor, not sad, not necessarily, because you have a person that's not sad, but not happy. And said, what happens to them? Because you're smiling. Just because a person smiles doesn't mean that they're happy. And it's, it's a reaction that happens in the body. Everybody else is depressed. Public is affection. That's the worst relationship out there, right? First, go out there to PD and like crazy, they're going to be finished within a couple of weeks. It's done. And then you don't have to show the world. When you feel like you have to show the world, all of a sudden it means you have nothing inside of you. Okay, so how does a person get to understand that a person is going to be uh, happy, you're going to be depressed. You go, WKJ, Camp of America. <laughs> you go and you donate to that camp, you wake up and you realize what it is one day. Oh my goodness, what did I do? Oh, we go for the easy job. You go for the easy job, and all of a sudden you're not happy. What's going on? Just because you climbed the mountain, that's how it is. It's a meaningful accomplishment. What happens if you woke up one day and you're like, who cares? Who cares that you climbed the mountain? Who cares? Right? You're like, oh, who cares? Right? What does it matter? You're like, I climbed the mountain. So what if you climbed the mountain? I've got to forget. I don't mean to whatever, but, but I do. No, I'm kidding. I don't. Maybe I do. <laughs> who cares if you climbed the mountain? What does it matter? Well, I climbed the mountain. Right? Another guy, he walked across the street. No, but I accomplished, and I built a puzzle. You understand? It's only because you gave meaning to it. Right? You went to the challenge, and you went and you overcame that challenge. I'll give you another challenge. Right? I'll give you another challenge. Climb up this building backwards. Undressed. So why? Why? What's the purpose? And it's just because people have given meaning to that. Because they've said, hey, look, that guy overcame something which is really difficult. Now well, I feel accomplished because I did something that other people think is good. You realize that? Unbelievable. How many things that we feel accomplished by from somebody else? M-I-C-K-Y-M-O-U-S-A. No, that's not for someone else. That's for you because you really feel like that's what it's about. Then you get a little bit older, you start to realize you're never selling lemonade in a corner for rent unless it's $40 a cup. You realize the value of money. You feel unbelievable. How many is the feeling you get when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing? A level below that is the feeling one gets when they're doing what they think they should be doing. If you think you should be doing it, you feel happy. Ignorance is bliss, isn't it? Well, there's another world, isn't there? All of a sudden, I fooled them. <laughs> Did you? Who'd you fool? You fooled them, you fooled yourself, and you messed yourself over. So there are people, now we've got to understand. If you want to really have happiness in your life, and you all do, money we know is not going to buy the happiness, and we understand, unfortunately, it brings a lot of depression along with it. What happens if you have a situation where you're told, well, okay, what if, what if, what if, but don't get caught up with the silliness with the side things. Understand that's just to get you somewhere else. When you start fulfilling, a, fulfilling your obligation, whatever, and all of a sudden you feel an unbelievable connection to something, so take a look. How does a person figure out what it is? Number one is a national mission. It's called the Torah. Number two is an individual mission. How does you get it? What's your toolbox? Open up your toolbox. Take a look at what you have. Oh, man, look at your life. I'm a lot like you. Right? Take a look. And what is that you have in your life? What were you given? When you see what you have and what you were given, then start applying it. There's nothing like it. So there are people I implore of you. I beg of you. Start thinking a little bit. What's meaningful in this life? What's the purpose? 
Where are we headed? Is it to make a lot of money? Is it to, to, to retire at 75, blind in one eye, can't really walk, have to use the bathroom every five seconds and go golfing? Is, is, that, is that what it's about? Is it about climbing mountains? Ain't no mountain high enough, you raise me up. Is that what it's about? It's not all about right, being What is it? What's the point? When you figure out, right? Que es el punto? When you figure out what the point is, there's nothing like in the world. Because now you're attaching yourself. Ain simcha katar sasvekos. There's no joy like releasing doubt, getting clarity, coming in line with it, and then living a life with real meaning, real happiness, and real purpose. Any questions, comments, stories, jokes, attacks, please keep them verbal, non physical. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I'll see you when I see you. Don't take care and bye bye. Mm-hmm.